Good morning. Good morning. Yes, yes. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to see some good um, some faces here that I haven't seen in some weeks. Uh, yes, Debbie, it's good to see you. It's good to see you. Uh, yes, uh, Kevin, we've seen you more than Becky. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, um, the Cafadanos are here. It's good to see them. Um, by the way, as you can see, there's about two families that are not here today, that are often here. Um, well, Mike and Sharon um, is not here today um, because um, they believe they have been next to somebody who was exposed to COVID-19, so they've been staying home um, so that we, um, so not, no one else can be infected in case something happened. Um, and also, I know May Capadano as well had something like this going on, so they stay home, the ca- Capadanos. Capadonas and Cap- Capadanos, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so they both are staying um, home, uh, but not because they don't want to be um, here, but because um, they can't be here. Um, but also, I want to say today, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, I totally forgot, it went out of my head. This, last week was Michael, uh, Mike Capadano's birthday. Um, and I want to wish him a, a happy birthday. Um, there are some people that you just, um, you know, now I understand why Paul, when he writes those letters, always have a, somebody to greet, somebody to thank. Um, there are some people in your ministry that God has put you to lead that you just cannot, can ever forget. And one of them is, is, is Mike Capodano. It's always working for the Lord. Always there, um, always thinking forward um, for God's kingdom, and it's just a breath of fresh air to have him um, around, you know. And I told him that, you know, I always tell them that I I'll give everything up, um, but I, but these guys that's been serving with us in ministry, I, I don't want to give them up. I want to have them for until God takes me away from ministry to be in heaven. So, Mike Capodano, I know you're home. Um, you're with us. Happy, um, um, happy birthday to you. So, it's, um, it's been a privilege that we've been preaching the Word of God in the book of Galatians. Um, I think today is our fourth sermon, fourth or fifth, fifth sermon, fifth sermon um, on Galatians. Um, Wednesday night was our fifth um, Bible study on Galatians. Sometimes I like to, to teach and preach on the same book um, so that we really have a good understanding of the book by the time we, uh, we're done with it. One of the things that I don't like is when people go to Bible study or go to a workshop or conference, what we do, we take notes, we take notes, and then when we get home, we put them away, never to look at them again. So I'd rather it to stay in your mind so that you can always have it at your disposal. And that's the reason why you'll find myself always uh, reviewing and repeating myself over and over again. Because by the time I'm done, I want to know at least you have 80% of it in your mind and not on paper. Um, God has been blessing us um, through this series. Um, and I hope um, you continue to be with us. And if you've never been to one, please Hop on online or come to the building. Um, Let us study the Word of God. Both the notes and also the Bible studies as well or on YouTube if you want to catch up if you've never been in one of our Bible studies. Uh, But today there's a sermon that I preach in this church at least once every year. At least once every year. And as I was doing, and as I was preparing Um, for this um, sermon, and I saw that it was a two-part sermon, and that sermon I preach at least once a year really, really corroborate with what we are teaching right now in Galatians, and today I want to take the opportunity to teach that so that next week you could really understand the next sermon that uh, we will be preaching. So we find ourselves in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, um, verses 1 to 6, and it reads, this is what it says. Um, Hold on for a second. Uh, 
It's okay. The guys are just having a little difficulty out, out there, so we'll wait for them just for one, uh, for about 30 seconds. Good? Or oh, oh, I could read it myself. Uh, yeah, Galatians 3. I, I'll read it. Galatians 3, um, verses 1 to, five, to 6. Okay. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before your very eyes? Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain? If it, really, if it is really uh, was in vain. So again I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? So also, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So as, as we said again, Apostle Paul was very perplexed because after he planted this church, after he taught them the word of God, he moved on to, to, um, to plant other churches because he was not a pastor, but more so of a church planner. He was going around and planting church. And when he left Gal um, Galatia, um, um, Galatia, he word came to him and said, whoa, there is a diff there's some people who are Judaizers who came, who come to Galatia, and these guys are preaching about the law. They're saying that, um, salvation is Christ plus the law. Salvation is Christ plus the law. Apostle Paul was dumbfounded because, as you can see in the text, he says, it, Christ, I preach Christ, uh, it was, it was um, clearly portrayed. He, what he meant was that, like a painter, paint a canvas, I truly paint what salvation was to you when I was here. That it's in Christ alone, through faith alone, by grace, um, uh, through, by grace alone. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. What is, what is this law thing I'm hearing you talking about? Somebody must have done a number on you. Who has bewitched you? Somebody gave you the evil eye. Somebody has put a spell on you. And Paul was so upset that because we, uh, he truly so clearly portrayed the word of God to these guys that he says, even if they did put a spell on you, you're still foolish for believing that because Christ was truly portrayed to you. And at the end of the text, he says to validate that, he says, so also Abraham believed God. So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. This morning, I would like to talk on the fine print of salvation. It's going to be a two-part series, the a two-part sermon, the fine print of salvation. Salvation is a term that is preached and thought Every week in all kinds of churches. But barely do we hear a message where the basic terms of salvation are explained to the people who are listening. So this morning, I want to take the time to lay out for you the basic terms of salvation as it pertains to the gospel Paul preached to the Galatians. And what, by what, what does Paul mean by, so also Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. But to do that, I'm not going to preach on, I'm not going to use Galatians, but I'm, go, I, I'm going, to, I'm going to, um, to use a text that I believe is even greater than John 3.16 when you're talking about salvation because in it um, contain all that John 3.16 is supposed to be and more. In that, in that book is the book of Romans. Romans chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. Romans chapter 4, 
verse 1 to 5. This is what it says. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, according to the flesh, discovered in this manner? If in fact Abraham was justified by works of the law, he would have something to boast about. And that's the reason why you cannot be saved by, by, by the law, by work. It's because if you can attain salvation by the law, by works, then um, God would owe you something. And God doesn't want to be indebted to anybody. So had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works. Wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trust God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. To the one who does not work. So we want to stay a little bit more on Romans chapter 4, verse 5. However, to the one who does not work, but trust God who justifies the ungodly, that person's faith is credited as righteousness. Before I lay down the fine prints of salvation to you this morning, I would like to explain three terms to you. I want, to, I want you to know exactly what those three terms mean. The first one is, what does it mean to be justified? He says, the one that God's justified. What does it mean to be justified? If we were to take the spirituality out of the word, it would simply mean to be totally acceptable. To be totally acceptable. That's what it means to be justified. But when you bring spirituality in it, so it means that someone is just, you are saying that this person is totally acceptable to God. Totally acceptable to God. Not 99% or 95%, 100% acceptable to God. It is something like if you weren't born in the United States. And you came to the United States and you attained a green card. And then after five years, you have the opportunity to become an American. And the moment that you go to the, uh, you go to the justice of the law and you swear in becoming an American, what does that mean? You are totally acceptable. You're not, you know less American than somebody who was born here. That's what it means. So you are totally acceptable to God as if you were never a sinner. That God accept you 100%. That's what it means to be justified. How about the word righteous? The word righteous in itself means to be fit for. To be fit for. Justification means total, um, um, Totally acceptable, but the word righteous means to be fit for. So what this saying is, the person who is justified is fit for heaven. The person who is justified by God is fit for heaven. You see, I always say this to you if you're paying attention. People say, well, if God is a good guy, why does he send God? Why does he send people to hell? God doesn't send people to hell. God quarantined people from heaven. You can't be in heaven with sin. It's almost with the same thing we're going on here with this COVID-19. You see, somebody believed that they were, they were next to someone who might have it. They believe that they can't have it, so they don't show up to church. They quarantine themselves. So they don't come to the church. In other words, if you have sin in you, you're not justified, you're not fit for heaven. That's why people go to hell. People don't go to hell because God sent them to hell, but people go to hell because they are not fit for heaven. 
We hear that all the time in, in the news. Well, this is an illegal alien. Why? Because they didn't come in proper way. They were not justified to be here. And because of that, to so many people, they are not acceptable. That's what, that's what those two words mean, to be justified and to be righteous. The next word is credited. What does that word mean? This is an accounting term. That means payment is being received on account of another. Payment is being received on account of another. You see that little card that is in your book bag or that is in your wallet? When you go to the store and you buy, you know you don't have money. But they give you the merchandise on account of. It was credited to you. You could go home with it even though you don't have money in your pocket because Visa says, I'll pay for him until he can pay me back. It is credited to you. For instance, if you lease a house, and it means if you lease a house to buy, if you lease to buy, have you ever heard that term? Lease to buy? If you lease to buy a house, what it means is your rent payment can be used to purchase the house later on. It is credited to you. If you, if you so choose to buy the house, all the, cred, all the payment you made do for your rent will be credited to the next, to the house that you are going to purchase. So your rent is credited as mortgage payment. It's a new status that is conferred on your mortgage. So that so 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 this is this this is what this is what it means to be justified. It means to be totally acceptable to God. It means to be righteous. It means to be fit for heaven. And and credit it means it's not because you are good, but because Jesus is good. It's not because you did anything to do that, but it's because Jesus paid it all for you on the cross. Now you get that. But what, what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 4 is that these people that God saved, these people that God said that are fit for heaven, these people that God says that are totally acceptable to him, these people that God says, I will make you righteous in order that you can be fit for heaven, uh, is on Jesus Christ's account. Not on your account. And that's the reason you cannot follow the law. It's that's the reason why Apostle Paul says, then if the law could give life, Jesus Christ died for nothing. It, be, it is because that the law cannot save you, that's why Jesus Christ came to die. But Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 4 talks about three characteristics. Three characteristics that those people whom God justified that God declares righteous, that God says is totally acceptable to him and fit for heaven, every single one of them have three characteristics. You will know it. The first characteristic is that they, every single one of them must be ungodly. Every single one of them, to receive God's credit, you must be ungodly. Listen to the text. However, to the one who does not work, but just God who justifies who? The ungodly. God does not justify churchgoers. God does not justify seminary professors. God does not um, justify pastors, deacons, people who tithe well, people who knows how to pray. God does not justify Baptists. Methodist, Presbyterian, members of the Assemblies of God, or Catholic, God only justifies ungodly people. But what in the world does it mean to be ungodly? What does that mean, to be ungodly? The word ungodly simply means you're not like God. 
You're not like God. You have to accept that you are not like God. But it goes in a much deeper way than that. It is more like the word on American. When we say as American, someone is on American, we're not saying they're from Russia. We're not saying they're from Canada. What we are saying is that this person is opposed to the fundamental principles on which the American government stands. They stand opposed to everything America stands for. So what we mean is that this person is an enemy of America. So when the Bible says God saved the ungodly, what the, what the Bible is saying is that God saves only his enemies. And that's the power of the word ungodly. So to say that someone is ungodly is to say that the person is opposed to the fundamental principles on which God stands, that this person is an enemy of God. Isn't it what Apostle Paul is saying in Romans, uh, in Romans cha in chapter 8? The, the, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile toward God. It does not submit to him, nor can it do so, so this person, this ungodly person, is an, an enemy of God. Because when God says yes, what do we say? No. When God says no, we say yes. We know the word of God says we must honor our parents, we must honor our spouse, but we, we usually dishonor them. We know you're supposed to keep our vows, but we often break our vows. We steal. We know God doesn't want us to steal. So everything that God stands for, we stand against. We know we should be pure, but we are often impure. And it's not something that just happens to us. It's not something that just, that just happened like this. It's not an accident. It is our nature. It is who we are. We are ungodly. We do not want God to mess in our lives. We like to call God on an emergency. When the car accidentally hit the sidewalk, we could God save me. But for everything else, we want him to stay out of our business. And God's verdict is that we are, we are all ungodly. People who are in desperate need of his forgiveness, of his justifications. So let me make it as clear as I know how. You will never be made right with God unless you admit that you are wrong with God. Amen. You will never be made right with God unless you admit, God, I'm a sinner. God, I am not like you. God, everything you have asked of me, I do differently. You will never be made right with God unless you accept that you are wrong with God. You will never be fit for heaven unless you admit that you are wrong. And that's a good news. It's not bad news. Because it put everyone on the same footing. No one has an advantage over one another. The lawyer or the lawless. The gunman or the governor. The teacher or the terrorist. The pastor or the prostitute. We all stand as ungodly people before the throne of heaven. In need of God's grace. Then the text tells us a second characteristic of the people that God justified. Not only every single one of them is ungodly, but every single one of them are unworthy. Every single one of us, we are unworthy. Listen to what the text says. However, to the one who does not work, to him or her who 
does not work. What the text is saying is this. No matter what you do, you can't ever attain salvation by doing something to earn it. All have sinned and what? Fall short. So no matter what you do, no matter how much work you do, and you see heaven, you see it, but guess what? You will fall short if you base it on the law, if you base it on work. And now I'll explain why so many don't, people don't get the gospel. So many people don't understand the gospel because the gospel goes against everything we've been taught. Since we were a child, a child. Because the culture tells us that you get what you work for. Isn't that what the culture says? You get what you work for. You go to kindergarten, you sit up straight, you get a sticker. <laughs> you go to Sunday school, you sit up straight, you get cookies, something. You begin to learn the lesson. You get what you work for. You go to high school, you work hard, you get a scholarship. When you get to college, you get the grades. You get to have a Latin phrase behind your name. Summa cum laude. At work, you make the most sell, you get the bonus. In a myriad kind of way, we are told that we get what we, what we work for. So now we turn to the pages of scripture, and scripture says God doesn't work that way. He doesn't do things this way. He's not men. He does not save good people. He does not save people who are worthy. And there's a logical reason for that. It is found in the previous verse. In verse 4, listen to it. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as what? As an obligation. If you had to work for salvation, God would be obligated to you. And God cannot be Indebted to anyone, then he would not be God. You understand that, don't you? You work for wages. And every first and on the 15, you expect to get a check. And when you get the check, you don't go around looking for your boss. To put your knees on the floor and worship him for paying you the check you work for. If you're like me, after, after six months, no matter how happy you were with what you, when you got the job, you think, I worth more, I worth more than this. And instead, of, instead of saying thank you, when you get the check, you give it the evil eye. Because you get what you paid for. You, you get paid what you work for. Because you, they owe you. That's the reason why you don't worship them. If salvation was by work, then you didn't have to worship God. Because he doesn't owe, you don't owe him anything. And that's true of whatever kind of job you do. I mean, can you believe it? Some of those people who play sports, whether it's baseball, basketball, football, tennis, whatever it may be. Do you imagine somebody's making $30 million a year just for playing ball? And these guys have the nerve to go on strike? I've worked for five years for one million. Half of that. Half of that of that. But these guys are going on strike for making 30 million dollars a year. 
You know why? Because they owe them that. There's a contract. You get what you work for. It is owed to you, and God cannot be an obligation to anybody. The creator cannot be in debt to the creation. And that's why salvation has to be a gift. And that's the reason why Paul is so upset. Paul says, having begun, having, having begun with the truth, having knowing, I've painted it for you that it's free. You don't have to buy anything. You don't have to pay for it. What's going on with you? Are you going back now? And trying to pay for salvation? And you know, and I'm telling you this, if you try to pay for it, you will shipwreck. You're not going to make it. You will fall short. You will not be fit for heaven. Just accept the gift. In one of those sermons in those past five weeks, I told you about um, one of the generals in the United States um, you know, who needed food for his, um, you know, his soldiers because they were hungry, they were near death. And he went to Clara Barton, who was in charge of Salvation Army at that time. And he came to her and says, Lady, I want to buy my soldiers food. And she says, No, we're not selling you. Lady, my soldiers are hungry. My soldiers are about to die if you don't sell me this food. You have the food. Why don't you sell, sell the food to me? Sir, we're not selling it. So the, the general gets so upset. And he walked, and as he's walking out, he saw somebody. He says, what's wrong with this lady? I have money in my hand. I told her my soldier is dying, and I'm asking for, to buy it. And she doesn't want to sell me anything. So what's wrong with her? The man said, sir, just ask for it. Because the food from Salvation Army is not for sale. You cannot buy it. You just got to ask for it. And that's how you can become fit for heaven. That's how you can become justified before God. You say, God, I know I am ungodly and I am in need of your grace. Please give me your grace. The text tells us the third thing. Tell us the third and last characteristic of those ungodly people. Not only they are ungodly, not only, not only they are unworthy people, but the last characteristic is that they truly trust God. They trust God with every time. They place, com they place complete trust, complete faith. In God, and that is the only characteristic that really matters. That's the only characteristic that makes a difference between those who are fit for heaven and those who are not. Listen to the text. But to those who do not work, but put their trust on the God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is counted as. Righteousness. What does the Bible mean when it talks about faith in Jesus Christ? Their faith is counted, is credited. Their faith? What does that mean? Well, let me explain to you what that means. What does it mean by trusting? Let me do it again as I've always do it every year. You know what it means to trust American Airlines, don't you? You know what it means to believe in American Airlines. Because when you're going somewhere, you just call. You buy a ticket. You don't know who's going to fly. When you get to the airplane, you don't call, hey, call the, call the pilot for me. Let me see your, your diploma. Let me see if you're truly a pilot. You don't even think about that. You don't know the last time they did mechanic on, on the airplane. You don't know if it's right to fly. You don't know if they have enough gas, if it's going to get you there. But you trust American Airlines, don't you? You just sit on that number, seat they give you, and they tell you to buckle your seat there. <laughs> and you did. You do. 
So if you know what it means to believe to put your trust in American Airlines, you know what it means to put your trust in Jesus Christ, don't you? If you know what it means to trust American Airlines, you should know what it means to trust Christ as your Savior. O.J. Simpson, I was my, actually it was on my birthday, June 12th. I woke up, it was somewhere around 6 o'clock. I saw a white bronco on, the, on TV. And was, actually, I was very upset because that was basketball playoffs. They stopped all this thing to show you OJ with his white bronco. They arrested OJ. They saw his hand with all the marks in his hand. OJ don't know the law. OJ went and hired the best lawyers money can buy. And OJ sat in the courtroom, never say a word. And OJ was acquitted. He was acquitted. There's no way in the world I'm thinking this guy should be acquitted. But he was acquitted. Why? He didn't know the law. All he did was put his trust in Johnny Cochran. And OJ was acquit, uh, uh, acquitted. So if you know what it means to put your trust in a lawyer, even though everybody may think you're guilty, you know what it means to trust in Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner. Let me give you the last one. Let's say you find out one of your family members are sick. They have an illness. And all of a sudden you read from the medical journal that there is a doctor who, have, uh, um, who can heal this disease. But you have to go to an operation. You have to go through an operation. What do you do? You could say you believe that doctor could do this all you want. But until you go to the doctor yourself, for him or her to put you under the knife, you don't trust. You trust the doctor. Guess what? You trust the doctor um, to put, what does that thing they put to make you fall asleep? Huh? Anastasia, they give you Anastasia or this gas and you fall asleep. You trust the doctor while you're not. <laughs> and these guys are cutting you. And after they cut you, they give you a little bottle with a bunch of little things in it and say, go drink that. You don't even know what these things are made of. But you go and drink it. That is because you believe in the doctor. If you know what it means to trust your doctor, then you know what it means to trust Jesus Christ. When you say, I am saved, what you are saying is you are an ungodly, unworthy person who must put, put his trust in God and in his son so that what he did on the cross, Calvary, can be accredited to you. That's what you mean. So when, on, so when an ungodly person, unworthy person, who did not work for it, simply put their trust in Jesus Christ. The Bible says they are justified. They are, they are acceptable to God. They can be assured of heaven as if they were already there. That's the reason why Jesus said to the man on the cross, today you will be with me on Calvary. Listen to what he said. What did he do? He says, God, Jesus, I am a sinner. I did wrong. You didn't. You see, I'm ungodly. And I know I'm on the cross right now. There's nothing I can do. Can you do it for me today? And Jesus says, yes, today it's credited to you. You are in heaven with me today. Doesn't necessarily mean today he's going to be in heaven. It means you could live as if you were already in heaven because it's already credited to you. That's the gospel. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. 
So to the pages of the Bible, we will see that's the term. You believe, you trust, you put your faith in God to do for you what you could not do for yourself otherwise. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. Let me read this hymn that I love so much just as I am. Listen to, the, to, listen to the lyrics of this song. Just as I am, without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me. And thou that bids me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, though thus about with many conflict, many doubt, fighting and fears, within, without. Oh, Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am in waiting not to read my soul of one dark blood, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot. Oh, Lamb of God, I Come, just as I am poor, wretched, blind sight, riches, healing of the mind. Yes, all need in thee I come. Oh, Lamb of God, I come. Thou will receive me, welcome me, pardon me, cleanse me, relieve me. Because thy promise, I believe. It is for those who do not work for it. Who simply put their trust on the one who justifies the ungodly. And their faith is credited as righteousness. Amen.